Hello everyone, welcome to Sansi Oz Diary. My name is Connie. If you're new here, you're welcome. I wanted to continue discussing the alleged poisoning um, news that came out of South Africa regarding six children that allegedly bought a snack from an illegal migrant shops in South Africa. Your mom and dad's small shops, puzzle shop, they call them in South Africa. And there is a, an interview with the public health officials regarding this issue and he was questioned about this incident. So let's listen to him and then I will discuss it later what I think it was going on here. So let's listen. Okay. Did he have the correct okay. papers? Is he an illegal immigrant as many people are saying that he is? Yeah, I, this, uh, yes, the, the, the report that we actually got is the, 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 the owner got a certificate, the, the certificate of acceptance. And, and yes, indeed, it's owned by an Ethiopian with no papers. Uh, yeah, so, so, so those, those reports are actually true. Okay. But what actually strikes us is that, I mean, we've got the, 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 the certificate of acceptance. But we were just want to establish in terms of what did the you know the, the you know the, the, the this kid ate. If you remember last year, I've warned them. I met with the spaza shop owners, national and actually with their national leadership, and I said that according to what the environmental you know health the practitioners health has have found on their investigation that majority of the spaza shop do not comply in terms of the food you know the health and safety food act. So they need to start having a quality management system and a disaster management system. Yeah. And then I even further to saying that so that you have this problem with the community not benefiting. I said, come up with a proposal. And up until now, that has not happened. And I met up with them again two months ago, they reminded them. So the call, I think, for them to be shut down, all of them, even nationwide, I think it's a, it's a genuine call because they are not complying. There are no systems in place to do that. So that call, you know, I mean, we're the people of the law that actually have to people, you know, a time to really comply. And I did warn them that this incident is going to happen. But I support the call that let us close and, them down. And it's not the first time. Be, be and I'm glad you said that. It's not the first time. It's not the first time. I mean, there are still families that are seeking yeah. answers from what happened last year. And the same place, yes. and the families are alleging that their children, and I know that you came out to dispute that, the, that, that from the toxicology reports, it wasn't the biscuit they ate, but it may have been something else that poisoned them. But yes. family are saying this was the same shop owner, that, that this is the same mm. shop owner who just moved a couple of streets away and started operating. Can you confirm mm. that? So we, we actually, yeah, no, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I can't confirm that as yet, but uh, we actually get into the docket. We're just, I'm, I'm going to go back to Nalete now. Okay. just to get in terms of the details in terms of that but i have my the, the call was that is that because we've given them time because remember last year i was i was lashed out on twitter that i'm supporting all this nonsense the spider shops are not good i said we have to engage as south africans then we engage with them they don't come to the party i think that we, we, we must close them down and so that there, there must be a reapplication we must audit them, you know, properly, and they must get proper papers to, to really uh, uh, work. Okay. There's, there's a lot of stuff. I think that we, we must have a debate about Please. this. But I, I, I would have thought that maybe we have, we have more time I because I want to tell you some of the dynamics. Yeah, some of the dynamics I, that I, we are experiencing. Yeah. We need so much more time, and we're going to invite you back. Yeah. And you know, I would say to him, the priority really should be about this family and. We really don't want to be um, talking about him, what he did, did not do. Uh, this whole thing is actually related to home affairs, uh, the border management, security, and who you provide accreditation to, monitor monitoring. He's already said in that interview anyway that they're not compliant. We saw that in that video yesterday, how the storage of chemicals with food, chemicals that shouldn't actually be stored there. They were stored directly next to food and holes everywhere, not temperature control. This is not how you run any food business. And I am actually so stunned 
that South African officials have allowed people like that to run a high-risk business like selling food to the public that have actually allowed it to occur. This is undermining the South African food safety laws that exist that have all been there for many years. You, I mean, I grew up in South Africa. I don't know of any incident uh, during my time of any child dying after purchasing any item from any mom and dad food store that mainly available in black um, community that are far away from the cities that rural and remote where it's so hard to go and find a major supermarket but these stop short shops have been booming and really run by these illegal migrants in the first place why would you allow someone who's illegal to be in the country anyway if you're illegal you don't have rights to work don't have any rights so the idea of having an economy that based off illegality, that's a big problem with me because we saw it can lead to a lot of uh, misuse. It can lead to a lot of these uh, people being, you know, subject to inhumane conditions. Why would you allow that? And we see that if this this higher unemployment and uh, why would you have this higher unemployment but still have this higher GDP? You know, there's a lot of profit cutting by businesses by employing these illegal migrants. And there's been a lot of raids that of lately around that issue. I don't want to go to that issue with labor issues of, but it is all interconnected. It's interconnected. The minute you allow someone who's illegal in your country to run high risk business, these sort of things occur because they're not credited. They don't have the skills. They don't have all the knowledge, the basic knowledge of really of hygiene, keeping the area hygiene, controlling the flow of air because they don't understand these things. They don't know it never existed where they came from. So now we are in the situation where children have died in South Africa. Nine, I mean, from the same areas, nine children with three last year, six this year. In other areas, there were other issues, issues as well. As I speak right now, there's a number of children now are, have actually been admitted in hospital. As we speak today, the 17th of October, the number of children that are in hospital being attended to as a result of food poisoning. So it's not interlinked with this one, but I bet it is because all of these cases, people reporting consuming these snacks. Like I said before, if you want to manage, you want to stop any any stuff with the, with the, the food that is contaminated, if you can't find the barcode, you can't find the batch number, you've got no other choice is to ban whatever the product you suspect that has been mentioned until the investigation is complete. So if you allow this product still being sold, why are you investigating this group of people here? Because you're not really sure where the, the, you know, the, the contamination occurred. And all this product from the black markets anyway. So even with that, yeah, that understanding of that, the, to protect the public, the South African public, the officials should ban any sale or resale of this product until investigation, until further notice. They need to hone in and investigate as quickly as possible so that this contamination doesn't spread into other communities. As we speak today, the other communities impacted with this contamination. And he wants us to feel sorry for him. I can't feel sorry for him because I feel like he is a big problem. People like him are a big problem in any society. Incompetent is a big problem. If you're, you really don't have competency, in your skill, you lead, it leads to this catastrophe. 
where you got a lot of influx of illegal migrants coming in and when they're there in coming into South Africa, then when they're there, it brought give them right to do things that to run these businesses that are high risk to import the reason why they're able even a were able to succeed in actually hijacking the the spaza shop in south africa is because of these illegal black markets items so if somebody comes in and and sells and open a shop next to you if you're south african You've been running your business really well. You've been uh, having your suppliers from the good from the company that is has been accredited as as meeting the GMP standard. You follow all the law, and you have somebody that comes in who is illegal, and then decide to order stuff from the black markets and sell them at a lower price than your price. What's gonna happen to your store? You're gonna lose customer. This is how they're able to do it. That how they were able, they were able to do it because of failure of government. Government did not protect small businesses in South Africa that were running these tech shops to protect uh, from this illegal entry of black markets. On top of that, now this illegal entry of black markets has resulted in death of children. Yeah, it's death of children. So people, consumer are going to buy product that are cheaper. But cheaper, people who are selling product cheap, there is a lot of cut costing somewhere. Uh, if they the product are made legitimately, they'll have to cut costs somewhere to compensate for that. But if the product themselves are, are made of low standards of poor quality that they able to get through the customs of the country and the country itself doesn't have laws and they don't enforce the law they ignore the, the laws that's there and so the people will keep bringing this black market stuff that are made of of poor quality with no hygiene stuff nothing that no gmp at all and you, it leads to uh, public health issues like this one we're seeing right now in South Africa unfolding right now. It's October, it's going to be December soon. It is unfolding and the public officials seems to be incompetent to deal with it. It is so incompetent in my view because I think the first step is to actually stop the sale of these goods that have been identified as a source potential source of contamination until the investigation is complete now you have more kids getting uh, being admitted in hospital as a result of the similar type of snack of a food being bought from these illegal immigrants um run spaza shop and even allowing them to even trade next to schools in the school area. This is a lot of it. It is a very um, area that needs to be tackled by strong leadership. If you don't have it, if you're not a strong leadership, like I feel this man is not a strong leader. Um, this is what you get. You get all this stuff because strong leadership starts from the entry, poor entry. What do you allow? What do you don't allow in the country? If you, you know, and administering the law, uh, making sure people who don't comply the law, there is actually a way to ban them from um, practicing, from doing stuff, from starting the business. The same person, it's alleged that the same illegal migrants who actually contributed to a death of three children last year was allowed to actually open another shop from a little bit a few streets away from where he actually start he killed those three children this is where the six children died so i mean this is a, it's a public health emergency this story it's heartbreaking to me to listen to it because it was highly preventable highly preventable now let's listen to the family and I must warn you guys the the story is confronting. Uh, the families are talking about the symptoms of these children, uh, what they 
they not they're not what symptoms they've noticed uh, first when they first arrived. A lot of commonality of the symptoms is about you know salivation, feeling weak, vomiting, and yeah, and just uh, heart rate going fast and then slowing down quickly. And yeah, the salivation was huge, and all of them have the similar symptoms. The the feeling of weakness and the vomit, salivation, and the eye, the rolling of the eyes. They describe it as a rolling of the eyes. I doubt it was a rolling of the eyes. I think maybe it's maybe a communication barrier because English is not the first language. It could be something like a meiosis, which we say, you know, the eyes, the pupil will change, become smaller. And um, that could be the case here that I suspect that what when they were describing the rolling of the eye was an issue here. But we can, you know, have a look at it and listen, guys. Let's listen to what this, this um, uh, family describing the, the day that their, their children died as a result after consuming this alleged um, snack in South Africa. So then she came back and saw her mom try to put her to uh, to bed because she couldn't. She was just like weak, right? So then, um, so then she started um, throwing up, and then that's when they called the uh, ambulance, I think, and they started, you know, asking for help on the on those on the streets, only to find out that one of her friend's father had um, had the same problem with her friend. Um, so yeah, then then they took her to Zola Hot um, Clinic and um yeah to get her some some help and then while they were there um getting help from the doctors um her friend's family came with a friend there and yeah and just like that she she didn't make it the other one came running and said uh she's vomiting uh, and, and, and the eyes are rolling i dropped everything which i was doing then i ran inside the house and then i picked her up and I saw a whole of foam and everything come out of from her mouth and I took her outside. I thought she's burning and to my mind, I thought it was a uh, uh, Caesar, you know, but, uh, but it, 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 you know, also it, it, it was going to be the first time I saw that because she never had that before. So that was, that, that the thing came into my mind. So now while I was busy trying to uh, helping her to wipe all the nose and everything and I saw her giving up. The body went down and everything just like that. And uh, I quickly ran to the neighbor to go and see if we can get an ambulance. And the ambulance, they told me the ambulance will be in 45 minutes. But on my arrival there at Shawala Clinic, the doctor told me that no, she's it's about then 30, 45 minutes gone. So which uh, I knew it already about that. So I think amongst the other, you know, out of the other children, she was the first one to go. Then the ones that they followed. She was very bubbly, very inquisitive, you know, very curious. She always wanted to know more about things, always willing to learn things. And she was, you know, she, she, she just had so much love. Um, whenever she sees someone that she knows or that she didn't know, you know, I'm coming in, 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 into the yard, she'd like just, you know, embrace them with love and hug them. And she was just that bubble kid, you know, that everyone loves. You know, she's like, um, she, she was my grandparents' last grandchild. So we all loved her, just gave us so much love and it reflected in how she, how much love she gave to other people. So that's what she, that's what we knew her as. <laughs> As you have heard, the story is really confronting and um, yeah, really confronting for everyone, everyone with a child and grandkids. This is, was a nightmare. This is a nightmare story. You don't want to be dealing with this issue. And people really take these things lightly. I feel like in South Africa, the authority there, they really don't respect South Africa's health, well-being and safety. Um, because if they did, they would actually start with the border control and border management to allow who allow who who gets to enter South Africa, you know, under which condition, 
and even when it did what sort of if they came illegal what sort of things they're allowed to do they're not allowed to do you know and so this is all intertwining connected with the economy um of south africa and everything else that's here that's why they failed they're unable to do anything and these people were able to displace the original south african who were running these uh, business safely uh, with um, enough support from the government and training and they brought in all these illegal people and breaking all the law of south africa anyway the very fact that it allows someone who is illegal to to actually operate a high-risk business like this in itself it questions a lot of these officials mentality their their intellectual understanding of things their role as public health officials so anyway i made a video uh just explaining uh, in more details about what i think is the likely um compound that led to this um contamination and led to the death of these six children I suspect it was organophosphate poisoning. Organophosphate po poisoning, what it does is a group of compounds. Anyway, it's a group of compounds. They all classify as organophosphate poisoning. Um, when you poison with these, you get a lot of excess acetylcholine in the system. How do we know that excess acetylcholine in the system is through the symptoms? The sweating. One of the parents said, oh, she felt hot and I put a basket of water. You know, it just tells me even the parents themselves don't know how to do face aid. They put water on them. They feel hot, sweating because they were sweating. They put throw some water in them um, and then they felt weak. They were feeling weak. And then first one of them, which the video is not shown here, but one of them described the heart rate going up. Uh, faster, beating faster, then slow down, which is what would happen. The heart rate that's go up first is the compensated, compensatory strategy, but it will eventually beat slower. This is what, you know, when you have excess stimulation of a parasympathetic nervous system and mostly the muscarinic and the nicotinic receptor, the weaknesses and also due to this excess acetylcholine in the system. So what it does, it binds it to acetylcholinesterase enzyme. That cholinesterase enzyme, it's the one that control and breaks down acetylcholine. So you don't, you have a, always have that balance. So when that compound binds to acetylcholinesterase, it means you're going to have a lot of acetylcholine in your blood. So we've got an acetylcholinesterase enzyme that is where the organophosphate binds into and that leads to excess acetylcholine in the blood, the neurotransmitter. That's what you get the symptoms of salivation, sweating, vomiting, okay, and a slowing of the heart rate. First, the heart rate will go up. But it will eventually go down and that is to compensate compensatory strategy that's why it goes up then it will definitely go down and the yeah it's a very serious poisoning and it require really an understanding and quick attention make sure the ambulance comes in and comes to you and it's really they have to at least have atropine with them somewhere mostly prefer preference is the iv atropine to try and give it until they can try and, and reverse it the, the you know the time it takes before you get into it to get atropine it will determine the survival because of uh, we know that these bondage of organophosphate and uh, cholinesterase enzyme they can form a bond that is unbreakable by the atropine. So it is, yeah, these chil children stood no chance. In the community where they live, in the lady far away from the major center, um, they stood no chance of survival in that, in this, if, if indeed what I suspect is true, which I think it's organophosphate poisoning. It's not a red poisoning. I made a couple of videos using an AIR to just explain to you different organophosphate compounds where they found. 
and also the red comparison as well with the red uh, poisoning so you, the red compounds that are available how these rats uh, thing chemicals that you buy from the shops how they kill the red the mechanism in which they kill the red and if you a person has had some issues with it contamination the symptoms quite different because they activate certain receptors in your body so you react differently mostly uh, with the red poisoning is cns activation so loss of consciousness and seizure that's why it's if they describe they collapse and had seizure first then that would have yeah i would have highly suspected a red poisoning versus organophosphate poisoning but with stuff described here by um the family it was a lot of um abdominal it was a lot of things with par excess excessive amount of acetylcholine in the blood um so i let's listen to this ai video that i made for you guys and we're going to come back and discuss it Organophosphate poisoning is a serious health concern, primarily linked to chemicals used in agriculture and warfare. Common pesticides such as malathion, parathion, and chlorpyrifos can expose workers and consumers alike to dangerous levels of toxicity. These substances disrupt the nervous system, leading to symptoms like headaches, dizziness, and in severe cases, respiratory failure. Additionally, herbicides like glyphosate, although not classified as organophosphates, are often associated due to similar risks of exposure and toxicity. Awareness of these products is crucial in preventing accidental poisoning. Moreover, chemical warfare agents such as sarin, taboon, and VX highlight the extreme dangers posed by organophosphates. Understanding these agents' lethality underscores the importance of stringent safety measures and regulations to protect public health from the insidious threat of organophosphate exposure. Organophosphate compounds disrupt normal neurotransmission by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, ACHE, the enzyme responsible for breaking down acetylcholine, ACH. ACH, a crucial neurotransmitter, facilitates communication between nerve cells and muscles. Normally, H is promptly broken down into acetate and choline, allowing for muscle and nerve relaxation. However, organophosphates bind irreversibly to ACI, preventing this breakdown. As ACI accumulates at synapses, both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors face overstimulation. This leads to symptoms like excessive salivation, muscle twitching, and potentially severe outcomes such as respiratory paralysis and seizures. Over time, the aged bond between the organophosphate and ACG becomes increasingly stable, complicating treatment. Immediate intervention with atropine and pralidoxime can mitigate toxicity, highlighting the critical nature of timely response to organophosphate exposure. So now that we've listened to that video, let's listen to another video about the rodenticides. The rodenticides is the term for a rat poisoning. Just going to give you a highlight on how rat poisoning works in the rats, how they get to kill the rats and enhance my understanding that the symptoms that these kids in South Africa displayed were consistent with organophosphate poisoning, not the red poisoning. So let's listen. Rodenticides are designed with precision, targeting various physiological systems to control rodent populations. Anticoagulants inhibit the recycling of vitamin K, disrupting blood clotting and causing devastating internal bleeding. Meanwhile, bromethylene acts as a neurotoxin, impairing nerve function and leading to the dangerous swelling of the brain. Tolecalciferol raises calcium levels excessively, resulting in painful deposits in vital organs and potential organ failure. Zinc phosphide presents a different threat by releasing phosphine gas, blocking cellular respiration and inducing cellular asphyxiation. On the other hand, strychnine obstructs glycine receptors, leading to painful convulsions and spasms, often culminating in death by asphyxia. Lastly, fluoroacetate interferes with the Krebs cycle, depleting cells of energy and hastening organ failure. Each rodenticide serves a lethal purpose, showcasing the complex interplay of biochemistry and toxicity. 
Hello, so now that we've listened to that definition and the difference between rodenticides and the organophosphate poisoning, we're going to move into the next uh, slide that explain in the different tests that are required to be performed. Um, some are a little bit easier, but some are, are, are difficult. But the most preferred one is HPLC, High Performance Liquid Chromatography. That, that one, it is the most accurate, it will definitely tell us that what the compound was in that that in that alleged snack that killed these kids, uh, because it's hundred percent accurate. That one, it is no but with or maybe that one, maybe and that the other easy ones that have got their own because uh, pros and cons, but the HPLC is the one. And that can take hours to days. I'm very concerned that the official they are telling South Africans that it, the tests haven't come back yet. I mean, it's either there's a lot of poisoning happening, that there isn't enough chemists to be able to do this at sort of um, compound identifications, because you really don't need a lot of sample with that one. You just need a micro to just... Uh, determined to actually test it to find exactly 100% with accuracy what compound was in that snack. Okay, you don't need a large sample to do it. But and then it's very specialized as well, the HPLC. Um, so that may be a reason why it's there's a lot of delay, a lot of people being poisoned, given eating this poison. Officials not really putting out the message just to make sure people don't even eat these uh, snacks. They haven't issued any that I, I can recognize that my family would tell me they have actually issued some of these warnings for people to not to consume these snacks. So if people are still consuming these snacks, there'll be more people getting poisoned, more people get to the hospital, more people are going to have um, the chemist, the lab are going to be fooled. So it will take a long time for the result to come out. That's what. That's the reason that maybe perhaps that's why it's taking so long for the report to come out. Okay, let's listen. Diagnosing organophosphate poisoning relies on various tests that assess movement of critical enzymes within the body. The acetylcholinesterase, ACHE, and butyrylcholinesterase, BCHE, activity assays serve as swift indicators, revealing enzyme inhibition within just hours, confirming exposure through decreased enzyme activity. For a deeper dive into specific compounds, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, GCMS, and high-performance liquid chromatography, HPLC, allow for precise identification of organophosphate agents in biological samples, albeit with a longer result timeline. Meanwhile, electrophysiological studies focus on the neuromuscular effects, offering insights post-poisoning. Lastly, urine and blood metabolite tests track breakdown products, while the erythrocyte AKI assay reflects long-term exposure trends, forming a comprehensive toolkit for monitoring recovery and ensuring appropriate medical intervention. All right, thank you guys for listening. Uh, this video is for general knowledge, uh, so you guys can understand what um, tests they can do, what's the symptoms correlating with the symptoms that this family have been describing. I know, so just in general about what you can do when someone has had a, a poisoning, the best thing is to ring the ambulance and also, you know, make sure you got a packet of peas, cold peas in the fridge. Sometimes people are sweating, you know, just cool them off as well that and a towel, soak it in a cold water. Yeah, that those kind of thing can help as well, you know, to try and cool them down. But yeah, the most important thing is to make sure you get to the nearest emergency and hopefully they can have IV, they can put an IV, give the atropine and help these families because that's a medicine for emergency anyway. So most clinics in South Africa they would have atropine sulfate to reverse anything that is uh, similar to organophosphate poisoning. Uh, yes, so thank you guys for listening. And if you haven't just subscribed, please consider subscribing and uh, press the like button and comments below. 
four more. Um, the story is not going to end. There's going to be a lot of this. I suspect there'll be huge influx of people in hospital in South Africa about this poisoning. You know, it can only be, it can be prevented. It's very preventable. Stop the sale of these goods. The alleged goods that have been have been identified as a problem. Stop the sale of it. If you haven't got the power to even stop the sale of the product that are killing people, then the country is absolutely a banana. It's a banana state. South Africa will become a banana state if you. The official don't have the authority to actually shut these things down. You know, that's the only thing you do is to shut this thing down. Just stop the sale of it until the investigation is complete. And also start shutting all these illegal migrants run uh, trading of goods that are very dangerous. Okay, it is very important for the safety of South Africans. Um, some people aren't doing the jobs, either they, if they're doing the jobs, there's an element of alleged corruption in there. Um, so we, we can assume that it's either they're very incompetent in their role or there may be some alleged corruption because this is to me is so obvious thing, it's obvious thing to do. When you are faced with this national emergency crisis of poisonous food, contamination, which could have been avoided 100% about who comes into the country of South Africa, what goes through the custom, the port of South Africa, the product, and if they can identify the manufacturer, um, you don't allow any of those goods to enter. Okay, protecting businesses that are already running in South Africa by not allowing these black markets goods that are unsafe for the children and the community of South Africa. Okay, thank you guys for listening. Until next time, have a lovely day. Bye for now.